Can you all hear, please? I'm Michael Mansfield, and just before we start this witness, it seems to me that it's important that everybody knows, uh, and the witness included, how we're going to deal with these sessions today. Some of you have been to earlier sessions that we've had in London, Barcelona, New York, and so on. Uh, the position will be that we will call witnesses. Uh, Dr. Barron's very kindly is there. Uh, I'm chairing, as you can see, uh, with Radia in the first particular section up to the break. Now, as we've only got one day, the timing is extremely important so that we keep to the schedule, otherwise it will spill over uh, and we won't manage to complete. So John very kindly has finished almost precisely at 20 past 10. You have got a timesheet, hopefully, in front of you, and you will see that this particular section dealing with genocide is 35 minutes long. And as chair or co-chair, we're going to try and keep very much to that, so effectively 20 minutes uh, for the witness to speak about matters that uh, cover the topic, in this case, genocide. And then there will be 15 minutes for questions uh, from the panel. Uh, again, they will be channeled through I either of the co-chair, and uh, I may have some questions as well. And each witness will be split in this way. So I hope that that's an understandable thing for the witness. I've been given little notices which I'll hold up. And I'm afraid we are going to keep to them fairly strictly. So if it appears to be a bit, a bit abrupt, I apologize. But I think you understand the logistics uh, of the situation. So bearing that in mind with each witness also, what we do not want to do is actually just get them to read out what's already in writing before you. I think each of you should have one of these folders very efficiently produced Hopefully you've got it. Now, in that <coughs> folder, you will find uh, a curriculum vitae applying to each witness, plus an outline of what the witness can or might say. The fact that the witness doesn't cover all the topics doesn't really matter because they're there in writing, and eventually, obviously, when we come to compile a report, the material that is spoken orally, as well as the written material, will be taken into account. So I hope... All of that makes a little bit of intelligible sense as to how we're going to proceed. Bearing that in mind, uh, may I therefore introduce uh, Dr. Paul Behrens. And he is an expert in genocide. He's a lecturer at Edinburgh University in criminal law. And he has edited and authored two particular works specified in his CV in relation to genocide. And so uh, Dr. Behrens... Uh, may I just, as it were, kick it off by perhaps suggesting as a start that you indicate uh, what you regard to be the... Have you got some water? No. It might be useful if Dr. Behrens, in his own words, can give everybody a definition, a legal definition of genocide, and then compare it with common perceptions and the use of the word genocide, and then we can move into the various criteria and the elements as the, uh, as the day goes on, you'll see applied. Dr. Behrens. Thank you very much, Michael, for your introduction. Um, I'm very grateful that you pointed out that my task is to talk about the legal concept of genocide, because I think that is perhaps the first remark that I should make here. Uh, that uh, there may be certain differences, there certainly are differences between the concept of genocide that is employed by lawyers and the concept of genocide that is used in the media, is used by historians and pretty much everybody else, the concept that some of my colleagues have referred to as the social concept of genocide. And it is important to point out that difference because the distinction can really be, lead to rather surprising results. Uh, if I can give you uh, one example, if I can start with that. Uh, now, it seems to me that we all were brought up with a particular image of genocide that we associate with genocide, that is certainly the Holocaust, that is perhaps the massacres against the Armenians in the First World War as well. And lawyers were brought up with that too, and the Genocide Convention, which was concluded in 1948, certainly did its, take its, its uh, 
uh, a, 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 was drafted under the influence of the Holocaust was concluded three years after the end of the Second World War. But from that stage onwards, from the 1940s onwards, the legal concept and the social concept developed in fundamentally different directions. I can give you two examples here from situations that arose after the Second World War and in which charges of genocide were quite commonplace, certainly in the media. One of them is the situation of Cambodia. You can see uh, a the memorial wall here from the memorial site at Tours Leng. The other one is the situation in Rwanda, and again a memorial site here from Kigali. Both of them situations in which charges of genocide were made. Both of them situations that are considered internationally. In Cambodia, we have an internationalized tribunal. In Rwanda, we have an international tribunal, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. In Cambodia, we don't have a single judgment that resulted in a confirmed genocide charge and a genocide conviction. We only have one indictment, in fact, that mentions genocide, and it does not, as you would perhaps expect, mention genocide in relation to the three million uh, Khmer people that were killed during that conflict. But it mentions genocide with regard to the Chan minority and with regard to the Vietnamese minority. In Rwanda, on the other hand, we have hardly a single judgment that does not refer to the genocide, and we have numerous convictions of genocide. So what that means is that it clearly is difficult for some reason for lawyers to come to a finding of genocide in all of these situations. Uh, the uh, reason, if I may be allowed some generalization, is in particular to be seen in the fact that the social concept of genocide focuses very much on the external aspects of the crime, on what is going on objectively, on the last victim numbers, for instance. The legal concept is focused very much on the internal part, on the subjective part, on what is going on in the mind of the perpetrator. And that makes the task of a lawyer from the outset incomparably more difficult, some may even say impossible, because you have to look into the mind of a perpetrator and to find out what is going on there. By the way, that does not mean that people that were charged with genocide and were acquitted ultimately on the charge of genocide go scot-free. Uh, in, in that regard, I may perhaps qualify, John, your remark about genocide as the crime of crimes. That is a remark that has been made by one of the trial chambers in the Rwandan case. But the appeals chamber was actually quite keen to come in on that and to say uh, it's, it's not quite as easy as that. We don't actually have a hierarchy of crimes in international criminal law. And in fact, you have seen in the Cambodian case, in the case that has been decided that far against the leadership of the Khmer Rouge, that they were sentenced to the highest sentence that is possible under international criminal law, i.e. life imprisonment, not on charges on genocide, but on charges of crimes against humanity. That perhaps is a, a starting point, and I, uh, I think it will become a bit clearer when I go through the individual elements of genocide. First of all, when we are talking about genocide, we are talking about a crime whose primary target are not the individuals as such, not the individual victims, but whose primary target is a particular group. John has already alluded to that question. And there are only four groups that are mentioned in the Genocide Convention. National groups, racial groups, ethnic groups, religious groups, political groups are left out of the equation. There was some debate in the drafting history on that, but in the end that was the result that the uh, uh, Sixth Committee and the other bodies that were concerned with the Genocide Convention came up with. The Convention can be very heavily criticized for that. I would be the first to criticize the Convention for its narrow scope in that regard. If you think of the historical mandate that the Convention had, if you think of the background of the crimes of the Nazis, it does not even fulfill its historical mandate. Uh, political groups were among the first, the Social Democrats, the Communists in Germany, that were persecuted, homosexuals as well, uh, the disabled were certainly victims of the Nazi crimes, but they are all not covered by the Genocide Convention. And for the current context for Operation Protective Edge, this of course causes difficulties if we go along with what, what John said earlier, that the primary target has often been described as Hamas itself. Hamas is presumably not seen 
objectively and not seen by itself or by the perpetrators as a one of the protected groups, but as a political group. The Palestinians, of course, as a group as such, would fulfill the requirements of an ethnic group and presumably, possibly, a bit depending on the question of statehood as a national group as well. There are various standards that were put forward, but I uh, suggest, because time is pressing, that I don't uh, go in, into much detail on that, but they are, uh, the standard that the tribunals these days have evaluated for identifying a group seems to be a contextual standard that employs objective elements and subjective elements. Subjective elements means we look at what the perpetrator, how the perpetrator perceives the group, how the group perceives itself. That is the first element, the first hurdle, if you want. The second one, the fact, so the, the victim needs to belong to one of these protected groups, the intent must be geared towards one of the groups as well. We have an objective element for genocide. Lawyers call that the actus reus of genocide. We have a subjective element as well, the mens rea, what is going on in the mind of the perpetrator. And it is interesting to note when you look at websites that discuss genocide in the context of Operation Protective Edge, that a good many people focus on one of these five alternatives that are outlined in the Genocide Convention. I believe you have that in front of you in the handout. Uh, and they tend to focus on alternative three, I think in particular the infliction of destructive conditions of life and so forth. That, however, is the point where the legal concept differs markedly from the social concept. Under the legal concept, the actus reus, the objective part, is actually fairly easily fulfilled. You don't even have to go to alternative three, which might or might not be a bit more difficult to prove. The causing of serious bodily or mental harm suffices for the fulfillment of the, of the objective part of genocide. It's getting even more surprising when you look at the requirements that are attached to the victims. The victims, as said, need to, become to, to belong to one of the protected groups, but there is, under the legal concept of the crime, no significant magnitude requirement. No minimum victim numbers need to have been reached. Quite different, quite different from the concept that is employed by historians, with I think the most famous example being Leo Cooper, who does not accept genocide unless a certain numerical threshold has been reached in terms of victim numbers. That means that in some regards the genocide convention can in fact be more encompassing than the social concept. But if you do not have a magnitude requirement on the objective side of the crime, that means that whatever threshold genocide might possess must all be on the subjective side of the crime, on what is going on in the mind of the perpetrator. And that is where the main difficulties then come in. And that perhaps explains why the international criminal tribunals are so very keen on preserving this threshold on the subjective side and have always interpreted the subjective side quite restrictively. On the subjective side, the mens rea, well, first of all, we have a, an, an easier element, if you want, which is the basic mens rea, which simply means you need a subjective element that corresponds to one of these five alternatives that I've outlined. If you have a perpetrator who kills a victim, the perpetrator needs to have had intent to kill the victim. But the big problem comes in here. The Genocide Convention, unlike most other crimes, even international crimes, requires an additional, an extra subjective element. And you have that in your handouts under the phrase, the intent to destroy in whole or in part one of the four protected groups as such. Each of these words carries meaning. Each of these words has been open to various interpretations. And in each case, the the principal line of the trial chambers has always been more restrictive when there were several alternatives to interpret uh, this element of the crime. To begin with the question of intent to destroy, that has led the, uh, to the question of what the appropriate standard for the intent should be. And there are two basic schools that have emerged in that field, the volitional school and the cognitive school. The cognitive school would say, well, it is enough for intent that the perpetrator knew, had knowledge that the acts would lead to the destruction of the group or would likely lead to the destruction of the group. 
If you apply that, then the threshold comes, already comes down a little bit. You are talking about cases in which attacks on civilians would automatically qualify if a particular, if a significant part of the group has been affected as long as the perpetrator was aware that that would happen, that the, there was a risk that the uh, substantial part of the group would be destroyed. But you also would have to include, presumably, cases of mismanagement. Let's say you have a corrupt head of state who, instead of spending the money that is available on foodstuffs, on medicine for his people, spends it all on golden palaces. Now, that would be a case under the cognitive approach where the per perpetrator, where the, the head of state might have full knowledge of what is happening to a substantial part of the group and still goes ahead all the same, and that would have to be classed as a case of genocide. The tribunals have been more restrictive in that. If you look at the language that was employed in the judgment, they tend to speak about the aim of the perpetrator being the destruction of the group, the purpose, the goal. Some trial chambers even mention the motive of the perpetrators being the destruction of the group, which indicates more of a volitional standard, a higher standard of intent. Perpetrator engages in the act because that is precisely what he wants. He wants the destruction of the group. Should be 10, I think. The second element the intent to destroy the group. This is a picture that reportedly shows the forced conversion of Serbian citizens during the Second World War by the fascist Croatian Ustace. If you think about it that way, a forced conversion, a religious group is one of the protected groups. Forced conversion would lead to the disappearance of the religious group. But that raises the question whether that is really what is main, meant by the term destruction. And it has a very practical relevance when we are talking in particular of uh, forms of destruction that are not quite as obvious. Ethnic cleansing, which is a point that of course has uh, been raised in the Palestinian context as well. It's the intent to remove the group the same as the intent to destroy the group. Again, the trial chambers have been very restrictive in that regard. Uh, even up to fairly recent judgments, the Popovich judgment that uh, confirmed that point, it needs to be the physical or biological destruction of the group. And again, the International Court of Justice in its judgment on Bosnia and Herzegovina against Serbia and Montenegro has been restrictive and has said uh, that ethnic cleansing might be important for evidence, but it is not by itself the intent to destroy the group. The destruction needs to be the destruction of the group in whole or in part. Here we have an interesting uh, comment that was made by Michael Ratner on the question of Operation Protective Edge, who felt uh, who stuck quite closely to the, this phrase and said, it does not, after all, need to be the case that the Palestinians as a whole are affected, and part of the group is sufficient. Now, the big problem with that is, if you take this phrase literally, then any pretense to threshold disappears, because numerically intending to go against one member of the group would be intending to go against part of the group, so that genocide could be committed against one victim, we don't have magnitude on the objective side, with the intent to affect only one victim of the group. The trial chambers have been more restrictive on that and have read a requirement of substantiality into that. The perpetrator needs to have affected the group, needs to have targeted the group, at least in substantial part. There are various approaches that have been advanced in order to assess substantiality. The approach that is perhaps most convincing is that that was advanced by the Kerstich Appeals Chamber that talked about the individual range and authority of a perpetrator. In other words, we have to check uh, in what position the perpetrator was. What is substantial for one perpetrator need not be substantial for all of them. And finally, the element of the group as such, this still has not disappeared. The group, even if it is targeted in part, needs to have been targeted as such. The perpetrator acts because the perpetrator has it in for that particular group. That is one of the reasons why in Cambodia we have so very few convictions that far 
on genocide and why the prosecution was reluctant to include genocide in the charges. Because while large numbers of the Khmer population were killed, it is difficult to say that the perpetrators acted because the Khmer population as such was the target of the perpetrators. There were political reasons, there were entirely arbitrary reasons, there were economic reasons as well. But the reason was not to destroy the Khmer population as such. I wanted to uh, say a few words on the question of incitement to genocide as well. Uh, just a brief overview of the elements. Incitement is a charge that is included in the Genocide Convention and is today included in uh, the subsequent instruments uh, of the International Criminal Courts and Tribunals. What we need for incitement, however, is an action that encourages or provokes the commission of genocide. And some of the uh, requirements that we have here are not all that easy to fulfill. There needs to be publicity for incitement, uh, that is fairly easy to prove that uh, the incitement needs to be directed against a non-individualized audience, but there needs to be directness as well, which means that the inciter puts forward an unmistakable message to his audience. The message will unmistakably be, re be received as incitement, and it needs to be a message that calls for immediate criminal action. It also needs to be a message that creates the potential of the generation of genocide. Genocide need not actually have been committed for incitement, but the potential to commit genocide needs to have been there. On the subjective side, mens rea for the inciting act itself is required, the subjective element, but the inciter himself too needs to have had this specific genocidal intent as well. So the, the standard for assessing incitement goes up with that as well. Finally, uh, I have been asked to uh, offer a few reflections on evidence. It's the final slide that I have. The problem, the big problem that we have with that is rooted in the fact that the tribunals proceed on the basis of the free assessment of evidence. That gives a considerable leeway to the judges. It is def entirely defensible in some cases because the judges uh, have the opportunity to take the individual aspects of a case into account. At the same time, it makes our job very, very difficult if we try to lay down guidelines for the assessment of evidence. And we have indeed seen cases where a similar evidentiary situation resulted in fundamentally different opinions by different trial chambers. In one case, acquittal to genocide for genocide. In another case, a conviction on the charges. There is, however, one rule that the trial chambers agree on, and that is that if a finding of genocide is to be entered, then the conclusion that genocidal intent existed must have been the only reasonable conclusion that could be found. If there are doubts about that, if there are other reasonable alternatives, these doubts have to be resolved in favor of the accused. Uh, two points um, that are worth considering here incriminating evidence, and then the trial chambers have talked a little bit about exculpatory evidence as well, incriminating evidence that shows that genocidal intent may have existed, exculpatory evidence that goes to the opposite. As time is pressing, I perhaps I can just uh, outline one or two pieces of incriminating evidence, the words uttered, uttered at the time, for instance, uh, in the Rwandan case, it may be quite clear because some of the perpetrators uh, go forth and say, kill all the Tutsis. They are as clear as that. It is less clear if a perpetrator simply makes uh, derogatory remarks, engages in hate speech, even in racial abuse. All of that may be evidence, but is it conclusive evidence? Is it evidence that only leaves that uh, possibility that genocidal intent was really what the perpetrator had in mind? Exculpatory evidence, uh, that is even more, difficult, it's even more difficult to find guidelines on that basis. One of them is the question of holes in the pattern, in other words, inconsistent conduct by the perpetrator. The perpetrator has accepted, has dis, uh, proceeded to kill members of the group, but on other occasions has shown selective assistance to members of the group. A very big problem for the trial chambers which have proceeded in different ways in it existence of actions that fall short of the destruction of the group. The entire destruction of the group need not have been achieved. Still, the Starkage trial chamber, for instance, says uh, 
uh, in the case of uh, the politician Starkic, that if the intent had been to kill all the Muslims that were the victim group uh, in his area, then the means would have been at his disposal. Uh, so that is something that trial chambers are sometimes prepared to take into account. And finally, the point of evidence pointing to different motives, in particular mil military motives. Uh, these are motives that from time to time have been considered by the trial chambers uh, as uh, militating against the assumption of genocidal intent. In the case of Operation Protective Edge, uh, that's my final point, but there are some aspects that I think uh, would require consideration in that regard. One of them are the warnings that the IDF have from time to time advanced before an attack had taken place on the group. Now, I know there are different opinions on the efficiency of the warnings and on the purpose of the warnings, but it is one of the points that need to be considered. Another point is uh, the, the fact that some of the cases where Israelis had proceeded, Israeli extremists had proceeded against members of the Palestinian group were in fact referred to the judicial authorities uh, of the State of Israel, including cases where we are talking about human shields. Again, a point that I think requires further discussion by the tribunal. That's all that, that I wanted to say. On this. Well, as you can see, um, we've exercised an element of discretion and allowed uh, an extra five minutes, so it cuts down on the question time. But I've got, and other panel members may have two uh, questions. I've got two questions uh, for you, um, and I'm going to deal with them obviously separately. The two questions relate to the proof of intent and the other question relates to the concept of cumulative or incremental genocide. In other words, not looking at one particular episode, but looking at a, a pattern or conduct over a period of time. Now, so far as the intent is concerned, uh, and I'm going to take a particular example because it makes it easier to formulate. If you look at one of the actus reus elements, in other words, the underlying objective elements, one of them is the deliberate infliction on a group con of conditions of life calculated to bring about the, its physical destruction in whole or in part. Now, I want to concentrate on that. When you're assessing the mens rea, the intent to do that, uh, you've mentioned the two schools of thought. But supposing you don't have a ready admission or, a, if you like, a statement in public by the perpetrator that that is the object, in fact, it may be denied entirely, presumably you're entitled to look at the circumstances and the impact of the acts themselves, particularly if they're repetitious acts. In other words, there's cast lead and now there's this operation in order for the tribunal to say we are entitled to infer from this course of conduct that the intent was to destroy according to this actus reus. Now, is that an understandable question? Yes. Um, and I, I, I think I'm sorry to have made it a bit long. But yes. Inferring intent from the impact of the acts, I think, is something that works very well with crimes that do not possess this additional subjective element. If you're talking about murder under the Anglo-Saxon concept of the crime, uh, that is fairly straightforward. If you say the, you, you see that a perpetrator had an alternative and still continued to, to take out his kitchen knife and to, to kill his neighbor with that, then it's, it's a tough act for the perpetrator then to say, well, but it, I didn't intend that. If, if there's no in the outside indication that, uh, it, that uh, adds to a different conclusion of that. The problem is that we have here an element that is not in fact reflected on the objective side of the crime when we are talking about the specific intent to destroy the group. And that makes uh, our assessment so much more difficult. It is, uh, if, if you keep in mind that the trial chambers have gone so far as to say that a pure knowledge standard is not sufficient. So simply knowing that a substantial part of the group was se severely affected, and that in itself has to be established whether it was a substantial part of the group. But uh, sim the simple knowledge of that would not be sufficient for that. If I can perhaps refer to the case of uh, the uh, attacks on civilians uh, that uh, have taken place, 
Now, uh, if you look at the case law of the uh, Yugoslavia Tribunal, for instance, there were numerous cases. If you think of the telling of Dubrovnik, for instance, numerous cases where the prosecution did not even go as far as to include genocide in the charges because they knew fully, fully well that it would be quite difficult to prove that specific genocidal intent if we simply have no indication of the underlying motives. And an even clearer case uh, might be provided by the Rwandan context. Yes, attacks on civilians can be part of the incriminating evidence, but they are presumably not the conclusive evidence in itself. Because when we look at cases in Rwanda before the ICTR, which talked about attacks of civilians, there, were always, there was always another element that was added to that. In particular, segregation before the attacks took place. So perpetrators arrive at a football field and ask the people whether they are Hutus or Tutsis, and then they proceed to kill the Tutsis. If you have that level of, uh, of evidence that, that is Could added to that, then Supposing you, have, yeah. you segregate a part of the Palestinian population into a place called Gaza, would that qualify? You have to show again the existence uh, of an intent that targets a particular part of the group. That is the, the, the starting point with that. Uh, you have to establish that a substantial part of the group had been targeted. Um, if you are dealing with that, uh, in, and that might well be, if, you, uh, if I take the, the analogy from the Bosnian case, the, the group might well be defined as the Palestinians as a whole, the targeted part of the group might be geographically limited to the Palestinians in Gaza. In these circumstances, you will have to show that the intent really had been to destroy that part of the group as such. That means that all the elements of evidence that I've outlined before, including the question of uh, is, does the evidence show that the perpetrators have done all that would have been expected of them if they had the intent to destroy the group, would come into play here. And included in that, would there be, sorry, these are supplementaries on this one, would, there, would it include uh, looking at evidence of the destruction of infrastructure and the prohibition of rebuilding of that infrastructure tend to suggest that the objective, the aim, the motive, was to destroy, in whole or in part, that group. All of these pieces, all of the pieces that you've given me, are important aspects of evidence that could be made in favor of a finding that uh, an intent to destroy um, had existed. But the question is whether there are conclusive evidence. The question is whether there are other alternatives uh, that might explain the acts. And in that regard, uh, I no noticed that Israel itself had very often relied on military reasons for uh, justifying its actions. Now, I'm, I'm not making a judgment on that. I'm not saying whether that is really uh, a, a, a valid uh, explanation for that, but these are points that need to be considered. If I do appear at times to be very restrictive in my approach to genocide, then uh, this impression is quite right. But I can tell you where my, my scruples come from and where my, my concerns come from. And one of the main elements for that is, in fact, a case that was brought to the ICJ, an advisory opinion on nuclear weapons, where, as you know, the General Assembly had requested an opinion as to whether nuclear weapons, the use of nuclear weapons, would be unlawful under international law. And several states were quite keen to ban the use of nuclear weapons, said, well, this is always a case of genocide. When nuclear weapons are involved, the destruction is so widespread. I mean, we've seen it all, Hiroshima, Nagasaki. The destruction is so widespread that we really have to talk about a case of genocide. And the ICJ was very, very strict on that and said, it can be a case of genocide, but you still have to show specific genocidal intent. That may have to depend on a case-by-case -case analysis. If we go by that very strict standard, then we have a very high threshold to negotiate. All right, final question in the dying minute or so is the, que the concept of incremental gen genocide, if you just address that. Please. Yeah, uh, incremental genocide is a point that has been made before, the, in, it's, it's especially with regard to Operation Protective Edge, uh, in particular by Ilan Pape. Uh, Professor Pape is a historian. Uh, and I uh, presume that he is referring very much to the social concept of genocide in that regard, 
uh, to the concept that focuses very much on victim numbers. And for a historian, that, that argument might indeed have some merit. In other words, you are, he's going back to, to the 1960s and before, I think, and he says this all builds up and what, what we end up with is genocide. Well, there are different concepts of genocide and uh, the social concept might be more forgiving in, in that regard. When we are talking about international criminal law, there are certain difficulties that come in with that and they come in in particular because of the rules that we have to stick to the principles that uh, do benefit the individual defendant in the courtroom, but that ultimately benefit all of us. We all uh, benefit from a rule that is ultimately geared against arbitrariness by the judges. And the principal element of that rule is that the defendant must have been criminally responsible for the act in his own person uh, before a finding can be entered that he is guilty. That includes, he needs to have committed the actus reus, he needs to have committed the mens rea, but he also needs to have committed both parts at the same time. There is this principle of simultaneity. In other words, if you're talking about a murder and you have a perpetrator who uh, has an enemy and he always hated the, the enemy, hated his guts, uh, but then they, they make up. And then on the next day he goes for shooting practice and by accident he hits his enemy and the enemy dies. The fact that he might have had intent two days ago to kill his enemy is neither here nor there. At the time of the killing he did not have the necessary intent. And similarly, if somebody kills his enemy by accident and then is jubilant about that when he finds out it is his enemy and dances on the grave, that intent comes too late. It is not an intent that existed simultaneously. That is my big problem applying legal principles when we are going along with Elan Pape's view. It is simply not good enough to say, yes, but in 1967 you did have intent. And we draw this intent now to our situation. Yes, there, was 19, there were the 1960s, but there was Yitzhak Rabin, there were the Oslo Accords in between. An historian might find it easier to uh, apply broad brush strokes to history a lawyer has to deal with a very specific situation on the ground. Thank you. I'm going to draw it to a close. It's exactly 5-2. Thank you very much, Dr.